My name is Joseph Ward McCoy, J-O-S-E-P-H, W-A-R-D, M-C, capital C-O-Y, Joseph Ward McCoy. I was born in New Orleans, Louisiana. That is my hometown. Well, my first introduction to Nashville actually was during a um, um, a sort of, um, um, well, how can I say it, a little rebellion at Oakwood. We had a strike down there to um, remove a president of the institution that we didn't think was um, the proper kind of leader for our school. And one of the active pastors in trying to calm the storm was Elder Jeter Cox, who pastored the Meharry uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Nashville. Um, so that is one of the things that makes me think about Nashville, Riverside, uh, and Meharry um, most immediately. And then Elder Dudley was president of the conference when I was a student at Oakwood College. And um, he passed it in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, and my aunt, one of my father's sisters, lived in Memphis and Elder Dudley passed it there, but he also passed it in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And my father, of course, we were 80 miles down the road, there was a lot of interaction between the two churches. So when Elder Dudley became president of South Central Conference and headquarters was in Nashville, that was one of the connectors. The other one was um, William Coopwood. We called him Billy Coopwood when I was a boy. And he went to Meharry to medical school. And I knew that I, that Meharry was in Nashville, Tennessee. And it appears to me that because he went there, I thought Meharry was an Adventist institution. Okay, so those are my initial uh, interactions and account uh, and uh, contacts with Nashville. And one other is that in my academy class, Cynthia Dent was, we were in the same class and she was from Nashville. And so was Grace Custard, uh, Grace Custard Ware, um, were all a part of my class. Or was maybe, Grace may have been a year behind, I'm not sure. Whatever it was, it was real close. And Oakwood was so small then everybody knew everybody. So, but those are my initial contacts or conscious interactions with the subject of Nashville, Tennessee. Okay. My first impression of Riverside Chapel was that's where all the big shots in Adventism went. I mean, uh, the hospital was here. It was during the days of of a sufficient, a, a tremendous deficiency in medical uh, services for black people and black Seventh-day Adventists looking for uh, a Seventh-day Adventist institution came to Riverside Hospital from all over the country. So, and the church affiliated with the Riverside Hospital was the Riverside Chapel. And so it's right across the street from the conference office. So all of the leaders of the conference belong to the Riverside uh, Church. I just never formally um, joined the Riverside Church because um, it, number one, you had to get there Friday night to have a seat for Sabbath. <laughs> so uh, it was more convenient for me to go to Riverside. And at the time, I mean, uh, Hillcrest, and at the time they were doing some evangelistic meetings on with Meharry Medical School and Tennessee State University and Fisk. 
And there were a lot of students that went uh, to that particular church. And because I was youth director at the time, and they were dealing with young people, um, I had a, a natural inclination to go there. Well, yeah, the Riverside Church, as far as I'm concerned, had a huge footprint um, and impact on whatever was happening in South Central Conference because it was the headquarters church. Um, uh, the hospital was known all over the country. So it was almost, you could almost not separate the two, the Riverside Chapel Church from the Riverside Hospital. And so um, my, I don't want to keep coming back to that, but my not being an official member of the Riverside Church is a geographical expression. I mean, it's just something you say and that's it. But we had lunch every day when I was youth director, when I first came here as a youth director. We had lunch every day in, in the hospital cafeteria and all the people that belonged to the conference and, and Dr. Dent and Dixon's office, their people, their employees, the conference people, the Riverside members from around the community. We all were in that, uh, we all came to Riverside for, for lunch every day. And sometimes the, um, the lunch period would run a little long, by about an hour or two, but and it would get noisy in there, and, would, and Dr. Den had to come in there and quiet us down or run us home, or run us out, and remind us that it was a hospital. But the, the imprint of the Riverside Chapel Church was all over this conference, yeah. and the membership was... And I, and I must say this, Riverside was always a church that participated vigorously in whatever was going on in the conference. I mean, from basketball teams to uh, attendance at youth congresses and whatever was going on. And uh, I remember there was, when I passed it in, in um, Paducah, Kentucky, there was a group that came from Nashville to help me with a community outreach program that I had. And uh, we were marching in the streets of Paducah, Kentucky. I can see Roy Gator's face right now as one of the, one of the uh, young people that came up uh, at that time. So you could not miss the Riverside Chapel because of its influence in South Central for sure. But by extension, every place else in the country, because of the hospital drawing so many people, uh, pastors and lay people, to Nashville for whatever was going on. So, yeah, a tremendous church and still and remains to this day, but always a church that I felt participated and supported everything that was going on and everything that was acceptable in the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. It, it didn't appear to me that they cherry-picked the things that they would support. When it was religious liberty time, they did that. When it was in gathering time, they did that. Evangelism, they did that. Message Magazine, all of that. You know, they participated vigorously for a number of reasons. I, 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 was, I, was, I was almost like Elder Dudley's valet. You know, he would allow me to go places with him. And I saw and heard a lot of things I wasn't supposed to see and hear. I was the youth director, of course. And um, and I didn't come to be the youth director until 78. Elder Dudley hired me in 1967. And that's when I first went up to Paducah, Kentucky. But And, El and Elder Dudley was the godfather of the black work. I know we don't like to use that term, but you can edit that out if you like. <laughs> he was in charge of the black work. I mean, he was. And so, I mean, he was like an octopus. He had his tentacles, his fingers, and everything that impacted our work positively. And he worked like a rented mule to, to keep that hospital from being sold and touched with the civil leaders 
not only here in Nashville, but all the way to to Memphis and got the Ford people, the Ford family involved in trying to save this hospital for black people. So the conference was trying to buy it. You understand? And the Adventist health system wouldn't sell it to him. As I recall, and there may be some people that contest this, but as I recall, he had the financial backing he needed. But I think because the denomination didn't want ascending liability, they were selling it off because, uh, what is it, the DRGs or whatever that business is, that um, the way hospitals were compensated for their ser for services had changed. The rules had changed on that. And I don't think they were able to get out of it what they needed to sustain the hospital. So they made a business decision. I don't fault them for that as much as um, our inability to come together. See, to save the Riverside Hospital, it didn't just belong to South Central Conference. It belonged to the entire black work. And all of us should have come together to make sure that that hospital survived. But Elder Dudley was in there pitching virtually by himself. So um, I was angry because I knew the work he put into it. And I saw, at least I thought I saw, what I understood from him to be the importance of black people in the Seventh-day Adventist Church pooling their efforts and their resources without regard to conference lines and 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 union lines and all those uh, demarcations that define territory because if you black you're just it you ought to just forget about the artificial lines drawn by other people that's relevant today you follow and so I was so angry that I went out and had some, some T-shirts printed up. And um, I got some friends of mine. <laughs> Alvin Kibble was number one. That was my partner in crime. Um, he was in the Allegheny East Conference. And we had some uh, T-shirts made. And I heard George Pearson say one time, he said, Bachner. I said, what is Bachner? He said, the Black Adventist Church in North America. Well, he was just talking, I'm sure, but that stuck in my brain. And I went out and had some t-shirts made that said Bachner, and it listed all the Black institutions that had closed. The most recent one was the Riverside Hospital, and then the shirt said, "What? who's next? Okay, and Alvin and Norman Miles and some other renegade friends of mine, we put those t-shirts on and we wore them to the Evangelism Council <laughs> as a protest for the selling of the Riverside Hospital. And of course, that didn't sit well with a number of people. I think Elder Dudley was quietly proud. <laughs> the The changes that came about as a result of losing the Riverside Hospital was, I think, symptomatic of what happened to black people in this country almost universally with desegregation, okay? And I, I look at my generation within the church as being, and when I say my generation, I'm talking about my generation of leaders. I was youth director of the conference, I was secretary of the conference, I was president of the conference. All of us from my generation walked in the footsteps of Cleveland and Dudley and Earl and Rainey and Phipps and C.D. Brooks and, and Elder Charles Bradford, whom I idolize to this very day, as old as I am. These people broke the ground for us. This is not to to, to leave out um, um, uh, Cheatham. I mean, it's unbelievable that the Allegheny East Conference 
created an academy in the 1940s or 30s or 40s, whenever it was, a boarding academy. A conference did it. When boarding academies were, were sponsored by um, unions. Okay? So these are the kind of trailblazers that, blazers that we had. We were witness to that. My generation, we were witnesses to the struggle. You follow? So that's in our DNA. Not only the leadership of that day, but our own parents who had to deal with the disadvantages, the sociological disadvantages of our country. So that was something that was instilled in us that said, you do the very best that you can because it's not you. You're carrying the race on your shoulders. All right. So if you lose your institutions, you have no credibility. You, you sell off all your land. You sell off all of your stuff. And they told me at the seminary, don't say stuff, Brother McCoy. I said, well, where I'm going, it'll work pretty well when I say stuff. But, you know, we sell off all of our holdings, the things that represent value. So my generation of, of leaders um, are the bridge between the Dudleys and the Clevelands and the Earls and the, and the Rainies and all those people and the current generation, you know? And I'm old enough to still be around. Um, and even my generation, you know, we, we're kicking the daylights out of the 70s right now. All right. And we have a responsibility to tell the real story to the younger kids, even though they don't they can't grasp it. They haven't had to live this this business and it has to be reinstilled in them if we're going to go forward as a people within the church and within the society society. That may be a long answer to the question that you ask, but. I got to go in. I guess the, the, the one thing I would want to say is uh, to the younger generations is wake up. And then to my generation, wake them up. You know, they have to be taught how to wake up. Because we haven't had to fight for very much in terms of, I mean, we're all over television. We're all in the movies. We've had a president of the United States, and all that business can lull you into a false sense of security. You follow? So, yeah, they we need to be awake. Uh, they need to be awakened um, because this thing is very real. And we have, we're living in a, a, a period in our country where there's a backlash to the progress that black people have made. And the only people that are going to be able to overcome that will be this current generation, uh, the millennials and the Xers. Um, you know, the, 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 the millennials haven't lived long enough to have wisdom, and they get angry whenever I tell them that, but they haven't, all right? And the Xers, in many instances, my generation failed our children. That's not true for my children, my three daughters, you can pick either one of them, and they will give you all you can handle about who our people are and where we should be going. But there are many of my generation chasing what I like to call the bubble of integration. You understand? And, and, and we fail to give them that because we were trying to safeguard them against the ugliness of the things that we experienced. So it's like they're sleepwalking, you know? And despite all of the ugly things that are happening right now, and you have younger people now that are out on the firing line with the blunt lines with the Black Lives Matter and all, all those kinds of things, um, a reaction to and hearkening back to the civil rights era which people will tell you is, is, that's past. We don't need to do that anymore. But 
in the absence of an army and a country outside the United States coming in to help us, all we can do is hit the street. At the end of this section. That's the end of this section. I'm the second of five children. Okay. My father was very well educated from grades one to three. <laughs> He's the smartest third grader I've ever known. <laughs> and he had a great personality. Um, taught himself how to fix watches and clocks and went into business. He was originally from Kosciuszko, Mississippi. And I think that's Oprah Winfrey's hometown as well. Um, but um, um, joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church out of the Baptist tradition my maternal grandmother and my mother and all of her sisters joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church out of the Catholic tradition. Okay. And my parents met, of course, in New Orleans, Louisiana. I am a sixth generation New Orleanian. Okay. Now, my brother, my oldest brother, who passed away uh, four years ago, used to talk about the great, great, great grandfather, and and he start when he start leaving African ancestry. I had to get off the boat. <laughs> you know, I just want to know about the Africans. <clears throat> but um, uh, my father was a straight shooter, and we were taught, and I could almost hear him saying it: "Stand for the right. If you have to stand alone." You know, so that's that's in my DNA. And um, Elder Dudley had a softer way of saying the same thing. So I was quite at, I was quite at home with him as my president. And I think one of his strengths was he would give you an assignment and get out the way and let you do it, get it done. And if it, you ran into some trouble, he'd say, "Well, you know the way he talked." Well, Joe, that didn't work. We'll try something else. <laughs> and I find myself quoting him a lot, you know, but that was consistent with what my parents had taught me. So I was quite at home here in South Central Conference. Um, <clears throat> so my wife is one of eight. Okay, and her family, um, you almost had to, had, had to have noise suppressors when they came together because they were really loud and really funny, All right? But let me go come to my immediate family, Judith and Joseph. I'm extremely and signally blessed with the wife that I have. As a matter of fact, and my wife loves to tell this story, a young lady that I was dating at the time told me that she was the perfect person for me. A girl I was dating who wasn't Judith told me that Judith and told me because we were on a double date together. I was with someone else and she was with her boyfriend. And that week following that, she called me up and said, you need to marry that girl. She is perfect for you. I said, okay. I mean, Judith is very intelligent, very personable, uh, friendly. And on top of all of that, she's cute. She's a pretty woman. So, I mean, that was wonderful. That was like throwing gasoline on a fire. I said, I can, I can live with that, you know. But we have been blessed with our girls, uh, with our three daughters, all Oakwood alumna. Yeah. Um, and uh, five grandchildren, three grandsons and, and two granddaughters. And I'm going to tell you how strong DNA is over this most recent uh, blow up over Colin Kaepernick 
my oldest grandson at his at his high school last year. Then during the national anthem, he didn't stand. And some, you know, some of the non-black, one of the non-black students, he's in a part of the, the, the city where black people are, are easily numbered. <laughs> and he, you know, he did the research on why Colin Kaepernick didn't stand up. It resonated with him and he didn't stand during the national anthem at his school. And one of the older white boys, let me stop talking in code, tried to intimidate him. And some of his other white friends told this, the bully boy to back off. Well, my daughter and her husband were out of the country at the time. And so I, I sent him a text. I called him, I either sent him a text or called him. And I told him, if anybody gets out of line with you, you call me immediately. You know, now I'm too old to fight and too slow to run, but I'd have been struggling down there to, to protect my grandson because his parents were out of the country at the time. But I was proud of him. I didn't have to tell him to do that, you know. And so it's, it's that kind of stuff is in your DNA. So my family, I mean, we're we're together every Sabbath that we're all in town. And we will sit around the table after Sabbath dinner and sing Day is Dying in the West when the sun goes down, because I'm an old time Adventist. I mean, hey, I believe in all all the stuff we've ever believed. And uh, my gra my grandchildren will say, Grandpapa, it's time to close the Sabbath. Let's sing Day is Dying in the West. And we have, we had some friends visiting with us one time and we, we, during Thanksgiving, and you know, we were closing the Sabbath and they didn't know the words. And so my, my, my wife's friend said to her, you know, maybe you should have the words printed out for those of us who don't know it. So we got song sheets of Day is Dying in the West that thick. So we passed them out yesterday for people that were at our house that didn't know the song. And we'll sing Day is Dying in the West. Sometimes we'll sing all four stanzas and other times we'll sing two stanzas and a couple of choruses and then we'll have a prayer and close the Sabbath. But that's who we are. I don't want to over-spiritualize that because we're not in church every time the wind blows. But my daughters are heavily involved at Riverside church. And that is a testimony to the Riverside Church because my ki my kids were raised at Hillcrest. Uh oh, I said it. <laughs> well, we were, and that's where our membership is to this present day. But because of what the Riverside congregation offered for their children is the reason that they are there. You follow? So that's that's very important. And all that's important to me as a lifetime Adventist. Because, yeah, I don't make any bones about it. I want my children to be Adventists and my grandchildren. I want it to run for generations until the Lord comes. And we all be around the, on the welcome table singing Day is Alive in the West. <laughs> but... Um, so, uh, yeah, blessed. Um, my wife had a, 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 an encounter with breast, breast cancer in 1991 and 90, 1990 and 1992. And the congregation that rallied around her, although our membership was not there, were members of the Riverside congregation. You follow? Um, my... Physicians, since I've been in Nashville, have always been mem always been members of the Riverside Church, you know. So um, they need to get me an honorary membership. I mean, and I want a plaque too with my name in the lobby. <laughs> right at this spot, two things I would ask of you to tell the personal hobbies of Joe McCoy, and I know one, and if you don't mention it, I'm going to tell it. 
uh, in terms of singing. And then I would like to, for you to share your personal health encounter of healing. Okay. I'll that you've that. been on a journey with. You know, somebody told me one time that a hobby is anything you do in your spare time that makes money. Well, if that's the case, I don't have a hobby. <laughs> I have You're a pastime. You're quite a tenor, I've heard. Um, I can say I come from a singing family. I mean, really. Um, I don't know that we were as great as the Willises. You know, that Willis Buffalo, that group you come out with. I mean, because they are, they are really, really talented. But maybe a step down from that. My, my mother... And her, all of her sisters had sang on the radio every Sunday in New Orleans, Louisiana, when I was a boy. Oh, yeah. And I had an uncle that directed the choir um, and, uh, for the church choir in New Orleans, Louisiana. I have a first cousin who was a part of the Metropolitan Opera, Shirley Verrett. Um, yeah, that's my first cousin. She passed away several years ago. And I had a couple of cousins that could out sing her. So um, if you catch me feeling good, I'll hit a tune. But I had a brother that sang much better than I did, and he loved to sing. Um, as I was coming along in the ministry, I didn't like, I decided I would be a preacher and not a singer. And I wasn't going to sing after every sermon. You know, I said, just do one thing well, son. <laughs> Don't try to be a preacher and a singer and do poorly on both of them, you know. So, but yeah, music is is all, I, all it runs all through my family. I mean, just pick two or three of us and you can get a tune, you know. And uh, so that's, I like to do that. I have liked to do that. But Bicycling was something that I did a lot in earlier years. Baseball fan, love baseball. Um, but uh, though right now, uh, whenever I can discipline myself enough to do it, I walk. Not enough, not nearly enough. And the youth director for the conference right now calls me periodically to make sure I'm into my program. And whenever he asks me, I start stuttering. <laughs> Along that musical line, I am tending to want to ask you, with the different kinds of health challenges you went through, what was some of your favorite hymns that carried you? Well, you know... Um, that you sang in your head. <sighs> You know, there shall be showers of blessings. It's always a very um, uh, favorite hymn of mine, even when I led song services. And I paid part of my college tuition leading song services all over the country. Oh, yeah. Nobody could beat me leading a song service. I'm not saying that braggadociously, but that was my reputation. In fact, um, in Los Angeles, song service, uh, MV, remember that? Missionary Volunteer Society, would be composed of me leading Singspiration for the whole MV hour. Yeah, and um, so music does run in my family, and I'm very proud of that, although I'm not one of the, the better singers. But... Uh, uh, God restores. I remember when during the time I was ill, I was watching the services over at uh, at uh, Atlanta Berean, and they started singing that song. I cried like a baby, you know, because I was in the process of being restored. That song hit home, you know, and the people, um, the way that. The members of this conference rallied and pr with prayer and money and unbelievable things that people did for me. 
and my family during the time of my illness. I, you know, I will never forget that, ever forget that. And to be here, uh, I'm thank, I thank the Lord for where I am right now. Chemo and radiation is not fun. You know, I had six rounds of chemotherapy from February to September. I had 25 rounds of, of radiation. All this happened during in, in, in the year 2013, 2013. And, um, you know, I, I didn't feel like I was dying. But chemotherapy will kill you. <laughs> I mean, it will kill you. But I was blessed, I think, because of my consciousness of the Adventist lifestyle. It helped me to be in pretty good shape and having been youth director for a period of time. And, you know, when you're young, you youth director, I'm past my youth director days. By that time, you know, you hold your stomach in so you look athletic, <laughs> you know, but... <laughs> but I was physically strong enough by the grace of God to endure that and come through it pretty well, you know. Um, but if my hair fell out and my my middle grandson, one of my grandsons, that was my youngest grandson, said, uh, he said to me when I was losing my hair that I, he, he uh one of the one of the hair replacement uh treatments hair for men or something like that i can't even remember the name of it he said grandpapa you can go to hair for men and get your hair back <laughs> he's concerned about me losing my hair but the way the members of the conference i mean praying for me at camp meeting at one of the more critical times of, I was about to be taken into intensive care um, here in, in at home. I was away from my treatment, which took place at Cancer Treatment Centers of America. And I was at the, the Illinois facility. But I was home and started bleeding. Had to be in a rush to the hospital and thought they were going to have to do a a uh, a transplant of uh can't even think of what it is but and i was on the way to uh intensive care and uh my wife called somebody and I called the president of the conference and asked them to pray for me and on the way to intensive care i didn't have to go the power of prayer. So I know something was going on upstairs. But to be able to come through that, you talk about a thankful person. I make um, I make a joke out of it from now, every now and then. People will walk up and tell me how healthy I look. I say, it doesn't have to be true, but I thank the Lord for the rumor. You know? <laughs> no. <laughs> but it is not a rumor. And I'm very thankful for uh, what I've been able to come through. And I don't, I don't like to talk about, I hear Christians a lot talk about what I'm going through. I hear it in sermons a lot. I hear it in songs and, and testimonies that people are giving before they sing about what they've been through. And I, you know, I, we all go through something, but there's far more to rejoice about that the Lord has done for us than the periods of suffering or inconvenience that we've gone through. I'm, I get tired of people talking about, oh, what I've been through, as if the Lord has forgotten about us, you know, and as if the devil has all the power, you know. I thank the Lord for where I am right now, you know, and it's only by his goodness and his grace i tell you what I've been through. I've been coming up the road singing and thanking him. That's my coming through. 
Joseph Ward McCoy. If I was never to hear another story in my life, today has changed my life spending this time with you. Really? Well, I'm happy. Can I say one more thing? Yes, you can. I want to talk about the the legacy of Riverside Hospital. Okay. Dear. I mean, of Riverside Church. The Riverside Church. Did you know your light went off? Yeah, okay. so I've been having problems with this battery okay. recently. You You're can, still getting him, though, right? Yeah. Well, you can edit it out. But um, Oakwood University is the 2,000-pound gorilla in black Adventism. I mean, it's the biggest name, the Oakwood University Church, the Oakwood University, blah, blah. But the Riverside Church, in terms of influence on historical South Central Conference, cannot be Oakwood. Oakwood Church cannot compare with that. If you're talking about a church, a, a congregation, because our workers' meetings were held in Nashville, okay, in the conference. Our workers' meetings were held in the Riverside Chapel, you know, across the street from the conference office. That's where all the devotionals took place and all the promotionals took place in the old Riverside Chapel. Okay, so that that church, that church, I don't even know if they realize the impact, the positive impact that that church has had on this conference historically. That church, okay? Hospital, yes. But hospital doesn't go everywhere. Church does. All right? And that's I was heartbroken over my failed attempt to buy back the old Riverside Hospital because I was trying to preserve that legacy. You understand? And, yeah, I made a big boo-boo. Uh, pardon my French. You know, I made some mistakes that didn't make that come to fruition, you know. But I was, as as we used to say, show trying, S-H-O. I was show trying to get it because of what it meant not only to South Central Conference, but what it meant to Adventism in the black community in the United States of America. I remember being up in Allegheny West Conference and made the announcement that we had gotten the old Riverside Hospital back. This is in the 1990s. And the, the place broke out in applause. You know, they were happy up there in Ohio because the Riverside Hospital, we only had it back for a short period of time. But there was rejoicing everywhere I mentioned it, you know. And so that inextricably tied to the place that black Adventism has in the consciousness of black people in this country, in my opinion, is the presence, the influence, the history of the Riverside Chapel Church. That's just me. But that's, how can you miss it? If everybody that was sick came here, where'd they go to church? They didn't go to Huntsville. <laughs> they went to church at Riverside Chapel. They came out of their sick rooms. But they could walk from the hospital out of their rooms over to the church. There was a bridge that took them straight into the church from the hospital. They didn't even have to go outside. Okay? So every sick black Adventist that came to Riverside for treatment, went to the Riverside Chapel Church. That's influence. That's legacy. That's history. Yeah, that's deep. 